You've selected a fantastic wine. This is a real showstopper. It's earthy undertones, silky tannins, and ripe fruit come together harmoniously. It's really gonna excite your palate. <laughs> In this video, I'm going to talk to you about how to pick out a bottle of wine. Some of you may not know, I'm a certified sommelier with the Court of Master Sommeliers. I got this back in 2017. It's a rigorous process. There's four levels of the Court of Master Sommeliers, which was started in the UK in 1969. There's the Introductory Sommelier, Certified Sommelier, Advanced Sommelier, and Master Sommelier. I am level two, so I am a certified sommelier. And to get that, I needed to do a special test, which involved a blind tasting opponent. So that's tasting two red wines, two white wines, and trying to guess what they are. A theory component, as well as multiple choice and short answer about all the wine regions all over the world. I'm not good at memorization. And then third part was a mock service examination. So they had like this big room with four or five instructors, each instructor at a table, and we had to give like a mock service and they would ask questions and everyone was like freaking out, including I was not, just like shaking and everything. So I passed that. It was a great accomplishment. I took a course at the International Culinary Center that's no longer there, it closed due to COVID, or it got acquired by ICE. It was like a 10 week program where we tasted eight wines a day, Monday through Friday. And that really primed my palate. I really got used to drinking wine. It was it was great. I could taste anything. My, my taste buds are level 9,000. Why I wanted to be a certified sommelier, I was working in restaurants, mainly in service for a long time and I thought that I would have better credentials which would allow me to advance more in the industry and people would just respect me more to be honest with you. My ego is at play. I thought like oh I'd be more respected if I learned more about wine. So I studied so hard about wine. I learned so much about wine and then I passed the test and now all these skills are not really so important. Do you really care about which bottle of wine you're drinking like I don't I care about safety I care about my family I care if we have food on the table not if this wine smells like roses or violets so I went through like a rogue phase I've stopped drinking alcohol for about like six months around. The last time I had alcohol was for my Valentine's Day virtual cooking class where I made penny ala vodka and strawberry shortcake. I had some alcohol then because I talked about wine. Other than that, I personally have not drank alcohol in so long. Not because I ever had an issue with alcohol. And I mean, of course, I've always had some drinks from time to time. I just wanted to see if I would be okay without it and how I would feel. My results, I feel great. But I think, you know, anything, you need to have balance. Too much of anything is, is bad. And I think wine is one of those things with a lot of history, a lot of culture, and a lot of tradition. And that's what's really interesting to me. I'm a rogue sommelier, but I'm still a sommelier, and I have these skills that I still wanna be able to share with you. So let's see what I can do. I'm a little rusty, but let, let's do this. <laughs> if anything, becoming a sommelier has taught me public speaking, how to interact with people. They use a lot of adjectives and really tell stories when they're talking about wine. That's so important. And I think telling a story and really engaging who you're talking to can do so much for you. More people need to tell stories. Imagine if you had a beautiful glass of Chianti Classico in an Italian restaurant. It was your first glass of Chianti. The waiter came over. He, he recommended this vintage. He recommended this producer called Fantodi. You had it. First sip. Wow. Delicious. Notes of raspberry, balsamic, toasted bark, mushroom. You were having it alongside with your pepperdelli bolognese, thick cut pasta with a rich meat sauce. You immediately felt like you were transported to Italy, walking along the Ponte Vecchio in Florence. Next year, you were traveling in Italy. You were trying the wine again, Chianti Classico, and you went to a local bar, and there was a beautiful guy. There was a handsome guy, like me. Uh, there was a handsome guy at the bar, and you asked him what he was drinking, and he said Chianti Classico. And he's like, would you like some? And then you shared a bottle of Chianti Classico. And then he ended up being your boyfriend fiance, whatever, and then you move back to the US. And then you would spend your summers back in Italy, in Florence, always drinking Chianti Classico. It could really change your life. Enough story time. So I come from a restaurant hospitality perspective, but I'll just give you some tips on how to pick out a good bottle of wine in any store. First off, let's cover some basics. You know, when you go to a wine store, kind of daunting. There's so much variety, so many bottles, like where do you start? So first things first, what's old world and new world? You probably hear this term bounced around a lot. Concept refers to physical place of origin. Old world regions are considered the birthplace of wine using the grape Vitis vinifera. New world countries are places where the grapes were imported probably during the age of exploration in the 1400s when Europe was 
colonizing everyone, for lack of a better word. But the wine was brought to other countries. Old world countries are going to be most of Europe, like France, Germany, Spain, what's the other one? Italy, yeah, Italy. I'm Italian, mamma mia. New world countries are going to be every other country outside of Europe. So United States, Australia, South America. So that's old world and new world. So there are some general stylistic differences between old world wines and new world wines, but there are many exceptions, so don't take this at face value. Old world wines are labeled by the region. For example, Chablis wine from France, nice mineral driven Chardonnay. Chablis is a region in Burgundy. The grape is Chardonnay. Another example, Chianti. Chianti, the popular Italian red wine from Tuscany. That is a region. The grape is actually called Sangiovese. So in the old world, they're very into place. And the vineyard, all super important. In the new world, say in the United States, they tend to label things by the grape. For example, Napa Valley Chardonnay. They say Chardonnay and then it's Napa Valley. They list more information. It's clearer to understand. For the old world, you need some more innate knowledge to be able to decipher like what the wine actually is. Number two, old world wines tend to be lighter in body, have a higher acid and have lower alcohol. New world wines tend to be higher in body or fuller in body. They don't say higher, they say fuller in body, lower acid, and higher in alcohol, okay? You watch the video again if you didn't get that. Number three, old world wines tend to be more earth mineral driven. It's a real natural expression of the wine. Whereas new world wines tend to be more fruit forward, have a presence of more new oak and are less earthy. What is new oak? New oak are, is referring to the, the barrels that the wine is aged in. If you use newer oak, you're going to impart stronger flavors into the wine. Kind of like vanilla, baking spices, chocolate, coffee, coconut, vanilla, these all, all whatever. But those are some differences between old world and new world wines to just start the ball rolling. So it's, it's definitely easier to distinguish new world wines because more information is on the bottle. All right, now that we got the basic gist out of the way, and if you have any questions, like leave a comment below, I'd be happy to help you. I know wine, it could be quite annoying, and people are like, ooh, 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 I'm not like, I know what I'm talking about. Like, I'm not like that. I'm I'm like Sasuke Uchiha. I'm a rogue ninja, I'm a rogue sommelier. I had to go away because I wanted more power. I wanted more knowledge. And then there got to a point where I was like, what's the point of all this power? Is it really fulfilling? I spent a lot of time in solitude for a long time, and now I finally emerged stronger than ever. That's me, Sasuke Uchiha. Chidori! If you know what I'm talking, forget it. Here are six points that will help you pick out a great bottle of wine in a wine store. Number one, what's your purpose? Is this wine a gift for a loved one, your mom, dad, girlfriend? Is it for a special dinner? If so, what are you making? Are you making braised short rib? Are you making pan seared salmon? This can influence what type of wine you select. Of course, it comes down to personal preference and whatever wine you like is always the best wine. That's what I like to say. But there are some general pairing suggestions, food and wine pairing suggestions, like red meat, red wine, white fish, white wine, you know, something like that to just keep in mind. But of course, it comes down to your personal preference. Number two, budget. What's your budget? I will venture out and say that you can get a great bottle of wine for no more than 15 to 30 US dollars. You don't really need to be spending more than that on a consistent basis if you're a wine lover. Of course, there are special occasions where you want to get a nice bottle of wine. What's your purpose? What's your budget? Number three, don't take things so seriously. Wine is fermented grape juice. Don't let me, Michelle, or Fernando tell you anything about wine. It's fermented grape juice. That's all it is. So it shouldn't have this like stuffy persona. I felt like when I was working in the restaurants, we would all like talk stuffy talk to one another and no one else could relate. We were like, oh, did you try this wine? It's like beautiful, blah, blah, blah. But no one else really cares. Like the normal people don't give a <laughs> about how wine is made because it's just grape juice. It is the grapes are harvested, then they're crushed, and then the fermentation occurs. So fermentation occurs naturally with yeast, but a lot of times growers add their own yeast to control the process. So the yeasts are what convert the sugar in the grapes into alcohol. After that happens, clarification, they strain the skins and everything, and then it goes into aging, aging in the tank, sometimes aging in the barrel, and then bottling. That's as simple as wine is. So yeah, it's just grape juice. Everyone's doing almost the same process, and there are many nuances. There are different ways that different families have done this different countries have done this there are so many nuances but don't get so wrapped up on it it's not worth getting riled up on like this is the right way to do it everyone makes their wine a little bit different but that's a general flow 
Number four, identify what you like. And how you gotta do that? You gotta try different things. You don't have any point of reference until you know what you like. So you gotta try different wines and you gotta be okay with not liking some of the wines that you pick out sometimes and then you know what you like and what you dislike. Number five, ask for help. The first four points that I just said, if you go to a great wine store, I like Total Wine Spirits as well as like your small local wine store. They have a lot of staff that are very experienced and very passionate about wine and spirits. Ask them questions, okay? A lot of them are willing to help you and a lot of them are not pretending some of them are. <laughs> if I was serving you, I wouldn't, you know, like if you just want to pop a bottle and kick it with your friends, like I got you, I know what you like. Ask them for help, tell them what the purpose of this wine is, your budget, tell them what you have liked in the past, and then they should be able to lead you in the right direction. That's very important. And if you go to one of these wine stores and you start to befriend someone that works there, they'll start to know your likes and dislikes. And whenever they get something cool and that they think you might like, you'll be the first to know about it. So definitely ask for help. Don't think you know everything or don't waste time in the wine store like looking at all the bottles like pretending like you know everything but then you don't and then you waste an hour and then you're like oh i'm supposed to buy a bottle of wine don't do that i know that i know it's you and lastly this goes back to point number two about the budget this is a big one for me number six we do six in china like this and in the u.s like this. don't let the price dictate your decision in buying wine. A wine that is running at 50% off discount might not be the best bottle of wine. It might be some like flaw, it might taste like shit. Conversely, an expensive $500 bottle of wine doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be good. If you're not drinking wine consistently, if you haven't developed a palate for wine, your palate is like a muscle, it needs to be worked out. If you don't have basic understanding of wines and you're not tasting wine regularly, you're gonna waste your money buying that $500 burgundy bottle just to flex with your friends. No point, don't do it. You won't tell the difference between a cheap wine and that $500 wine. I'm telling you right now, even myself, it's not worth it. When starting to get into wine, don't try to think that price dictates value all the time. Okay, that, that's my point. You can buy a $30 bottle of wine, invite all your friends over, and actually know what the hell you're drinking, and then be able to describe it in detail to your guests saying, oh, this is from the island of Sicily. It has a Mediterranean climate, really tropical breeze in the day, cool at night. It makes for their nice ripe grapes. And this wine in particular comes from Mount Etna, which is an active volcano in Sicily. So it has a really nice minerality and sandstone flavor profile. I think you'll really enjoy it. Just See, you automatically know more than just saying like, oh, this is the whatever $500 bottle. No, don't don't waste your money, I'm telling you right now. So those are my tips, I hope that helps you. Nowadays, if you refer back to what I said in the beginning about stylistic differences between old world and new world, the characteristics, the styles are, are blurring. New world producers are starting to take a lesson from old world producers and some old world producers are even trying to implement new world practices like adding new oak and, and this sort of thing. So we're really all getting connected. The industry is still evolving. An example of this, is what I have right here. So this is Magna Carta 2014 from Napa Valley. This is a Cabernet lead blend and the style that it was made was influenced by France Bordeaux blend. Okay, so this is how they wanted to make wine, but it's from Napa Valley. Napa Valley is a great place to make wine in California. It's one of the premier wine regions. You should go there. I went there too. Napa Valley is a great climate, like ocean breeze, mountainous terrain, very fertile soil, volcanic soil, warm days, cool nights. And each region in Napa Valley is quite different. Each vineyard is quite different. This is Magna Carta 2014. I'm really excited to try. I'm gonna open this up on my birthday because I haven't drank alcohol for a while, but I'm gonna try this out. If this is a California wine made in a France Bordeaux style, what is a Bordeaux style of wine? So Bordeaux is in France and it's close to the Atlantic Ocean and it's made out of five grape varieties blended. It's usually Cabernet Sauvignon. <coughs> it's usually a Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot lead blend with Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot, Malbec, and Carmenere. That's six. Six? It's usually less fruit fault. It's usually less fruit. It's usually less fruit forward. They also typically possess a stronger minerality. Whereas California Cabernets are dense, rich. It's hotter than in France. The grapes get riper. So it creates wine that's fuller body, higher in alcohol. Usually in America, we like to age in new oak, so it has more of a vanilla, coconut flavor to it. But in Bordeaux, they don't have that strong oakiness. It's more natural, it's more characteristic of the wine. So this is like a true expression of Napa Valley right here. So I can't wait to try this. Magna Carta 2014. Let's look at the specifics on the site. This was a collaboration between David Choi, Los Angeles native. He's been in the wine game for a long time and he's been back and forth to Bordeaux, really inspired by France, like he, he knows a ton. And then 
two winemakers, Peter Heitz and Scott Palazzo in California. So together they created something reminiscent of Bordeaux. And I'm just reading on their website right here about the Magna Carta blend. So this is 2014. Let's see. Magna Carta Cellars Napa Valley Profiteri Red 2014. So they only released one wine at one time, it seems like. This is our artistic vision of a world-class left bank Bordeaux red. This is what it says on the website. Our grapes are sourced from the finest vineyards in Napa Valley. On the nose, there are beautiful floral aromatics of red cassis, which are notes of cherries and crushed blackberries, along with subtle background tones of clove and white pepper. Oh. The palate has has a rich, flush mouth feel with sweet, dark currant and blackberry fruit. Fabulous texture with excellent density and weight. The finish is bold and complex with hints of dark chocolate espresso finishing with focus. <clears throat> you would think you would watch a wine video and the guy would be drinking wine instead of drinking lemon wine. And let's see the blend here. It's made from 65% Cabernet Sauvignon, 18% Merlot, 14% Cabernet Franc, 3% Petit Bordeaux. So I'm excited to try this. I'm gonna open this up for my birthday, but this seems like a real show stuff. This seems like a great bottle of wine, perfect for my birthday. It seems like they put a lot of care and craft to this. Focus on this, one vintage, one style of wine. And each year it's gonna be different. Thank you, David and team. Can't wait to try this. Magna Carta 2014, Napa Valley. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Hello. I'm just gonna give you a quick couple points. In Italy, Barolo is from the Piemonte region in northern Italy. Barolo is a region. The actual grape that they make Barolo from is called Nebbiolo. Another Italian wine, Chianti. Chianti is a region in Tuscany. The grape is Sangiovese. In Spain, let's go to Spain. Ole! Rioja, if you've heard of it. They have red Rioja and white Rioja. So Rioja is a region. It's in north central Spain. So red Rioja, it tastes kind of like Cabernet, bumped up. Tempranillo and Grenache are the grapes. And white Rioja, which is very tasty, is a blend of white grapes, and I don't remember them, but the main grape is uh, Viura, Malvasia de Roja, Grenache Blanca, and Tempranillo Blanco. I think that's it. There could be more. In France, Burgundy, we have white Burgundy and red Burgundy. What's that mean? Red Burgundy is gonna be Pinot Noir, always. White Burgundy is gonna be Chardonnay. Chardonnay is like a shapeshifter. It, it takes on a lot of different flavors. But seriously, watch out for Chardonnay. Oh, he got mad. Okay. White Bordeaux and Red Bordeaux. White Bordeaux is a blend of Sennelian and Sauvignon Blanc. You should try White Bordeaux, but everyone knows Bordeaux for red wine, and that's a blend of six grapes. So Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Petit Verdot, Malbec, Carmenier, and Cabernet Franc. Okay, those are the grapes. You don't really need to know these grape varietals, but there's just some bonus knowledge for you. Ding. So yeah, that's all I got to say. For more information, I would check out a couple resources. Winefolly.com is great. It's not pretentious. They have YouTube videos and everything. Watch winefolly.com. Also, uh, if you're really interested in going deeper, this book called Wine, Wine Bible, it goes over every single region, their wine, the culture, the tradition, and it also points out some wines. So this is, this is a great book. Culture, history, and recommendations for all the countries, even in China and Japan and Korea. Like, Watch out, Asia, they're, they're, they're making some wine now. There's also an app and website called Vivino. So that's like a site where anyone can leave a review about a bottle of wine that they had. Now, you can use that directionally. There are people that don't know what they're talking about on there leaving comments. I find that wine is very subjective, so how you think it tastes might not necessarily be how I think it tastes, and that's okay. Don't be embarrassed if you think it tastes like this, or don't be afraid to let your voice be heard to say like, oh, I believe it tastes like this. Okay, that that's the that I can't take in the industry. Last tip, just a general tip for old world wines. If you see on the bottle like Reserva, it could mean that it's it has more stringent aging requirements, which could be an indication of quality. So just something to look out for. Wine has been produced for thousands of years. It's ingrained in culture, traditions, and people's lives. There's so much history in it, and that's what really interests me. And there's nothing more special than having a wonderful meal with friends and family, delicious food, and having some wine. I could remember planning our yearly Christmas party when I worked in the restaurant. Two years in a row, we took him to my favorite Chinese restaurant in Hop Lee. My family also used to take me there. I would 
order everything and it was BYOB so we could bring all the bottles of wine that we could have and we were just eating you know so much food like we'd have two tables each table would have 10 dishes we'd have lobster fish we'd have noodles rice pork chicken everything everyone was amazed They're like Michael this is amazing I remember one year someone brought four bottles of wine and we were like, where did you get this wine? And they're like the wine store down the block and they said it was the mystery bag and it cost $10 for four bottles of wine. So we're like sick. And one of the bottles of wine was like pink truck or whatever. That probably wasn't the best wine, but we still drank it and we still had a good time. And we actually, we wanted to ice the wine at Hop Lee. They brought out like big soy sauce buckets. So out there we were like, icing the wine and drinking it out of like teacups, like it didn't matter, we were having a great time and that's what it's all about. If you drink wine or not, just have a good time, drink responsibly. I'm Michael Nicastro, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions about wine or life, let me know. I'll let you know how this is on my birthday. Be safe, I'm out. Oh, look at the color. Swirl it around. Wow, I get blackberry, cranberry, rosemary. I smell the alcohol, this is very full body. Let's try it out. Very smooth. The fruit is very ripe. Ripe strawberries, ripe raspberries. A little balsamic. Super nice.